Hi, I'm Jay John. Welcome to Facing the Canon. My guest on the program is Tom Price, speaker, evangelist, and apologist. Tom, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you for having me. Delighted to have you. Well, let's go back, wind back. I gather your teenage years were very turbulent. <laughs> a bit of rebellion. Some. Some drink and drugs. Can yeah. you tell us what was going on during those teenage years? So I wasn't the happiest boarding school kid. And I think part of the way that I expressed that was to pull back from the project of education as such. So I found myself getting in quite a lot of trouble with the schools that I went to and every couple of years I'd usually go to a new school to have a fresh start to try again. Some years later I was the tutor at a theological training centre after I'd come to faith a lot later and I walked through the library and there sitting there was my old headmaster and his mouth fell open. He nearly died of shock when he saw me. Um, it was great <laughs> to see him. And we went out for lunch eventually, actually, afterwards. And So I, he couldn't believe... He couldn't believe what had happened. Oh, my word. OK, but your uncle encouraged you to go to university. Was that... Prior to that, what were you thinking after school? What would you do with your life? So I'd really dropped out of school at 15, 16 with a smattering of GCSEs and nothing beyond that. And mostly I was thinking then about work. I'd taken about seven or eight gap years because you could take gap years, it seemed, unendingly, and that freed you from any responsibility of having to think about the real world. At least that was the way I used them. And so I had one Christmas was staying with my um, parents and I came back from the pub very late at night and my uncle, who was previously the lawyer, one of the main lawyers for the Beatles, he was sitting there at the kitchen table at one o'clock in the morning and he talked to me about how at the beginning of his career he'd done philosophy at university and it had shaped his thinking. As far as I know, he wasn't a, a, a believer. He, he, he just was telling me about something that helped him in his life. And that whisper of a, you could go and you could do this, was important because it, it was a valuing of me. It was telling me I could grow and I could think. And that was, that, was, that was quite encouraging. But it also pointed me towards an area of life, an area of thinking, where I found that I really had a good time and I enjoyed that. That led me to do a philosophy degree and everything changed as I did that degree everything changed. How did the change begin? So I remember turning up to a lecture in computer science and philosophy and the particular lecture was about artificial intelligence and at the end of the lecture I waited for the professor. I sort of sitting in the side waiting for him to finish talking to anybody else in case my question was silly and people might laugh at me. And as he left the lecture room, I went up to him and I said, do you think we will ever be able to make computers think like human beings? Now, I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't a religious believer, really. And I had a suspicion that there might be something more. But for me, the way of explaining the world was scientific. It was logical. It was evidence based. So I didn't at that point have any time for religious belief. And I, because that's what I thought religious belief was and what Christianity I thought was. So I said to him, do you think we'll be able to make computers think? He said, it all depends. I said, what? I said, he said, it all depends whether you think a human being is a complicated biomechanical machine or whether you think a human being has a soul and a spark or something different to them in addition to the biology. I said, that's, that's a philosophical question, isn't it? That, that's a bigger question. He said, yes. That took me then into philosophy that opened the door to questions like, what is a human being? Where did we come from? What, what are right and wrong? How do we understand all the big questions of life? And I threw myself into my philosophy degree at that point, because it was not only a great thing for me to do in terms of advice for life, 
but it was actually my personal search. It was, why am I here? Why are any of us here? And I was so blown away by what I saw. Yes, and, the, and actually the comment from the professor was a bit of a curveball, wasn't it? It's, it? it's as if he pulled the rug from underneath your feet and made you think again. Okay, what eventually, how did you eventually encounter Jesus and discover that Jesus was the way, the truth and the life? So I started to see that in most of the major areas in philosophy, all of the major areas, that there were thoughtful Christians, thoughtful Catholics, thoughtful believers expressing interesting points of view, well-argued, logical points of view. And so I walked away and I remember thinking, there's one thing you've got to give it to these religious believers. They're really engaging, they're thinking, they are offering reasons. This is not a jump, this is not a leap. They are laying out all sorts of interconnected, logically consistent, systematic reasonings for their points of view. That was intriguing because I'd been tempted to adopt the point of view that they didn't do that, that they would just take it on faith, or they would just say, well, this is what the Bible told us to believe. But that wasn't the way they approached the subject and the, the topics that I thought were really crucial. So I began to have more respect for their points of view. Then, gradually, as I listened and leaned into their arguments a bit more, as I started to read people like G.K. Chesterton and J.P. Moreland and William Lane Craig, I began to be persuaded that not only were their arguments reasonable, but their arguments could be true. So I began to slowly be persuaded that it was real. So I came to a sort of deism, really, where I thought God was there. I thought that the arguments were reasonable. He provided a grounding for ethics that was a really good explanation. God could provide explanations for how all sorts of things in the world happened and all sorts of um, questions could be actually well provided by that sort of answer. But I didn't, it wasn't personal. It wasn't, it wasn't real to me. It was, just a, it was just a belief system. I thought it made sense, but it, but it wasn't personal to me. After a little while, I realized that my scores for my predicate logic homework for, for the mathematical computer side, science side of my degree, were plateauing a bit and weren't, some of them weren't that great. So I had to reduce the amount of marijuana that I was smoking because I was on a few spliffs a day. Yes. And in order my answers were more accurate to what they actually wanted rather than more creative, I had to, I had to smoke a bit less. That meant that I reduced and I had less to lean on. I had less that was sort of insulating me from my own personal existential heart questions. And hopefully a little bit more alert. Yes, yeah, definitely a bit more alert. Um, but. But my heart questions went back to stuff with my parents and went back to stuff with school. Where will I find love that I can depend on? Where will I find people I can trust? The, what is happiness and can I ever know it? Wh who am I and does somebody know me? These sorts of questions all came bounding forward. I had the, some of the intellectual answers, but I hadn't connected the two together. But as I reduced the amount of marijuana I was using, my heart opened up in a way. That was also slightly confirmed by movies because as I watched some films like romantic comedies and all sorts of other movies, war films like The Thin Red Line, films that are quite strong like Magnolia by Paul Thomas Anderson, these films made me feel validated in my own personal journeying. And created a lot of curiosity. Huge curiosity. And made you think again. I felt less alone and I felt like these questions matter. Look, great modern film artists and directors are asking these same questions. So I got to a point a few months later where my friends had got fed up with me going to parties and saying, let's discuss my spiritual hypothesis. Because I had this sort of viewpoint and they said, well, we don't want your, we don't, don't preach, don't, we don't hear your religious viewpoint. I said, well, I'm not religious. I don't, I think some things are true, but why didn't, why didn't you want to talk about it? And they were uh, sometimes a bit resistant to that, which was intriguing to me. I eventually got to the point one night where I knelt down in my room on my own. I didn't really know very well any Christians and I just held out my hands and I just said out loud, 
God, I'm absolutely sure you're there. I'm, I'm sure you're here. I'm sure you're here. I'm convinced you're here. You're real. And I'm convinced you're pure and you're holy and you're good. I don't know how you can be close to me because I know I'm not pure. I know I'm not good. Will you clean me? Will you sort me out? Will you forgive me? Can, can I have a friendship with you? And nothing happened immediately. But over the next few days and over the next few weeks, all of these reconciliations and healings in my life in relationships started happening. I bumped into an ex-girlfriend and we forgave each other. I stopped using drugs. I didn't really recall making a decision to stop smoking pot. But from that day on... Something just was put shifted. right in my soul. And that led to a friendship with Jesus. I began, God began to reveal that he'd provided a way of me being forgiven in Jesus. And I started to read the Bible. I started to meet up. I found this group of Christians at the university, at the Christian Union. And they said, oh, you must have come along to some of the talks or maybe somebody gave you a, a gospel. I was like, no, this happened on my own in my room. God met me and I've, I've become his friend. I don't know how, but it's yeah. happened. What would you call yourself now in terms of what you do? How would you describe that? I don't really know. Um, I think I'm, um, I'm a Christian evangelist who loves philosophy, loves apologetics, loves film, loves teaching the Bible. But I, I'm really an evangelist, I think. Um, I'm, I'm an evangelist apologist and I love to train and to do um, I train people to do evangelism and to do the work of an evangelist as well. Well, let's talk more about that. So you, you work for a ministry called Ocker. Yes. Tell us, who are Ocker? Ocker are the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. And we have two sides to what we do. There's a equipping training side where we run an online course with different elements. We run in-person courses that we're developing. We run training days, we come and do church weekends, we will equip um, really anybody who invites us and that we can fit in the diary, we'll come and do our best to equip for the work of evangelism. And then we do that out of our excitement and joy at being evangelists. So our teaching comes out of actually doing it. And we fulfill each year loads and loads of opportunities to speak into different layers of society around us. We sometimes will speak in a business context, we'll sometimes speak in academic context, we'll sometimes speak to undergraduates, to kids in schools, to people in churches, to lay folk. Anyone who wants to hear the gospel presented in a way that is hopefully winsome and engages with their questions. But that's one particular thread really of, 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 of the way we approach things. We love hearing people's questions. They're tricky questions, they're tricky objections, their doubts, their worries. And we love equipping people to answer questions. And we like pr showing people how questions quite often lead to Jesus. So Tom, help us understand this. If, if there are good, true reasons for the Christian faith, why do people dismiss it and consider that many people who are Christians, oh, it's just a leap into the dark? I think it's easy to paint your, your opponent or your adversary as, as stupid or as um, naive. Ig ignorant or naive. And that's where conversation and discussion gets closed down. We end up in these sort of matches where we throw grenades at each other, sometimes on Twitter or in different places. The heart reason, the, the actual core reasons why somebody might be, might might look into Christianity or might be presented with reasons and not believe, is because God isn't primarily interested in forcing our minds to believe in Him. I think that God has set things up in such a way that He wants to invite us to choose to pursue Him and investigate Him. Pascal, a great mathematician, Blaise Pascal, said that if God were to reveal himself in a forceful way to our, that we wouldn't have any possibility of doubting him, then it might help our minds, but it might harm our hearts because our hearts wouldn't then have a freedom to be able to say, 
I want to know you. I'll tell you a story. I was at boarding school. I didn't really know how to relate to girls. The whole school went co-educational overnight, like, like just suddenly 300 girls arrived in the school. We didn't really know what to think. We were 500 boys in the school. There was a girl I quite liked and I would go for walks with her over the playing fields, talking about questions and talking about life, being a young philosopher perhaps. And I gradually thought, oh, I quite like her. I wonder if she might like to be my girlfriend. And I didn't really know much about love or those sorts of things. Everything I'd read in girls' magazines or in watching rom-com movies sure. didn't really equip me no, terribly didn't well. didn't really know how to navigate. Okay, so what I thought yeah. I'd do is I'll declare to her what I think. I'll declare my love, my interest in her. So I went to my study, to my bedsit, and I, I took out the pad of paper my parents had probably given me when they sent me off to boarding school with a fountain pen, and I wrote this letter. It was such a fat, gushy, awful letter, I had to sort of fold it and hold it down to get it into an envelope, and then the envelope starts bursting open, so I'm wrapping sellotape around it. I take this sort of Franken letter to her, and I put it on her desk, and it's, it's like 15 pages of gushy, over-the-top, quite strong, communication, me saying, I think I love you, will you be my girlfriend, I love you forever, you know, it was over the top, I know. Anyway, I put it on her desk, I ran away into the night, afraid of her reaction, I suppose, I should have been. Her face when I saw her later, it's just shock, just pure awkwardness, it was just, it was awful, I wanted the ground to swallow me yeah. up, it was terrible. Embarrassment. The embarrassment, the friendship was never the same ever again, because I'd been so strong, I'd been quite forceful with her. Now, God had a wonderful other plan for me in the end, but we do sometimes see how strong communication can change somebody's response. God, I think, wants to invite us gently to get to know him, to be open to a friendship with him that we choose, that we're open to. So I don't think that the reasons that primarily people reject God are evidential or informational. I think it's to do with the heart. Do I want to know him? Am I willing that he might see me? Am I willing to consider that I might need forgiving or that he might be holy and that might leave me with some things to work out in front of him? As well, Tom, as teaching and equipping and training, you're also on the side studying for a doctorate. I Tell am. us about that. What's that on? So I'm looking at theology and philosophy, I'm looking at a problem in theology and philosophy called the problem of divine hiddenness, which is the academic way of talking about Job's question. Where are you? Why don't I see you? Why is this happening? And it's connected to theodicy, the area we go to when we think, why is there so much suffering? Why is there so much pain? How can God be good? So I'm looking at that problem of divine hiddenness, but I'm looking at it from a, a bit of a unique and different point of view. I'm treating a filmmaker as a theologian and philosopher and I'm trying to work out what he says about that issue and how he interacts with it. So it's a theological, philosophical and film um, uh, analysis. S very stimulating. <laughs> you, you, you love films as I do and interestingly it's amazing how God can speak and communicate through movies. What, what, what are your favourite movies where you have sensed God speaking through? So I find that there are particular movies like The Journey of Private Wit in The Thin Red Line, where this army private is trying to see God's glory, trying to see the glory of and the goodness in the world in the middle of a brutal conflict. I, I found that film really hit me quite hard. Then a film that also affected me was The Tree of Life. These are all by the same director at the moment, who is the director I'm looking at, Terence Malick. But I would also point to films by Christopher Nolan, like Memento. I found that film particularly raised questions of identity and truth and the, our, our desire sometimes to create an identity and sometimes the way that that identity is something that's given to us that we discover rather than something we invent. Um, I 
love the film Magnolia. It's a very, very strong film with some very strong language in it. It has to be said and uh, needs a warning over it. But for me, that film raised questions that ultimately led in no small way to me discovering Christ. They, they were, they, these were films by some of them non-Christian filmmakers who I found sp speaking to me and raising questions that God then used. Some theologians have talked about how film in presenting us with complex problems and questions in stories and in narratives opens up a space for theological reflection. And in that moment of theological reflection where you sit back and you say, what's happening and why did that happen and why did those characters react like that? We both project ourselves, but we also find that we, we're reflecting about God and about life and there's a space of honesty there sometimes. God, the creator of the universe, is, Tom, would you agree, trying to get everyone's attention and he's, he, he communicated through creation and the Bible says creation is trying to get our attention and he's spoken through history but God's greatest revelation of himself was in Jesus for all time, for all cultures. How do we today communicate that to people that he's trying to communicate with them? Yeah. I think, I think that people generally approach the world as we tend to be a mixture of thinkers we tend to be sometimes intuitives or f we might say feelers where we where we relate to the world through story and through um, principles sometimes and values causes and then other times we relate to the world pragmatically god's revealing himself in these different ways in the great book of creation through science, through the natural world, and then in special way through Jesus, through the, through the Bible. As we're thinkers, as we're intuitives, as we're practically exploring the world in our different ways, and some of us in different moments might take more of a thinking approach, and the other moments we might take more of a, an intuitive approach. So if you're choosing someone to love, you might be sort of or, or to marry, you might be more of a blend of, you know, the intuitive sort of story, but then you might say, oh, wait, I've got to think this through. I've got to, I've got to be careful. I think God is revealing himself to each of us in the way that we're most open to him. I think he plays a long game in many of our lives, and he knows the moments where we might consider him, we might open the door to him in our hearts. And I think that God will speak through these different means, these different ways. If you look at the way that people encountered Jesus, you have this incredible diversity in Jesus's approach to reaching out to people. He never has two conversations the same, but you also see different people finding what they need, confirming that he's the Christ. So somebody might come from, from a Jewish point of view, they might sit with Paul in the synagogue and he's proving and explaining from the scriptures that Jesus is the promised Messiah. That's one route. Another person might walk up to Jesus and they have a practical need. He heals them and then shows them by forgiving their sin who he is. Somebody else might hear a story and be drawn in through the parable to a, a world that describes something that intrigues them and draws their heart. Somebody else says, I need to touch the wound in your side. I need to, I need to be convinced in that way. Others lived with him and had that experience of being around him. Each of us in our own ways is being revealed to. God is revealing himself to everyone simultaneously. I think the question is, are we open? Are we, are we, do we close the door on certain ways that he might show himself? How can we open the door and react and respond with integrity to the truth he's revealing to us now? So he's, he's revealing himself all the time in different ways. Let's not close the door in any way. And and for you, it's fascinating that even though you, d you weren't instructed, you weren't guided, nobody advised you, uh, you reached out to him. And uh, that, that's quite amazing, really, that you felt, uh, well, I'm going to reach out to God in the best way I know how. Mm. OK, <clears throat> what advice would you give to anyone who wants to reach out to God? What would you say to them? I think I'd say... Think about God's nature. Think about if he's really God, what 
what is he like? What might he be like if he's worthy of worship? So y- yeah, he's great and he's all powerful and he made a world. But what are the features of the way he's revealed himself? He's revealed himself in Jesus, and that that really clearly describes a God who is loving, who's full of grace, who's kind, who's accepting, who will bring light into your life. So respond to the light, respond to the the offer of his love. Think about um, if he's holy, then what response will that mean on your part if you don't always consider yourself completely spotless and holy? For me, becoming convinced that God was a real and holy being, that he had revealed himself in Jesus, that he was loving and kind, that led to me saying, I've got to take the area of morality really seriously. Now, one way of responding to that would be to say, I've got to make myself better for God. I've got to be good. I've got to be really good so I can be that holy. I knew that was a doomed project because I knew myself. I knew my own heart. Instead, I had nowhere else to turn but his mercy. And that's what I see in Jesus, somebody who's abundantly merciful. Tom, if there's anyone now tuned in that would like to do that, would you lead them in a prayer? I'd love to. Lord Jesus, I want to open my heart to you. Thank you that you're real. Thank you that you're good. God, I pray that you would accept me, that you would forgive me. I recognize your holy nature. I pray that you would forgive me, that you would draw me into your truth, that where I have the opportunity to learn from people about you, to hear the Bible, to be encouraged by other Christians. I pray that I would respond to those invitations. Lord Jesus, I want to walk with you. I want to know your forgiveness, your power and your love in my life. Will you be my friend? I want to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Tom, for praying that prayer, sharing your story and joining us on Facing the Canon. It's been a delight. Thank you so much. If you did pray that prayer, great. And can I encourage you uh, to read the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, uh, and find uh, a local Christian church that you can go and grow. Thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.